7. Go to Children's Church at this time. We are going to be in the book of Deuteronomy today. The book of Deuteronomy. Hey, somebody was excited about Deuteronomy. We'll see how excited you are when we're done. We'll um, I meant to mention it earlier, and it, I just had too many notes up here, but Juanita had texted me this morning. Um, they took Paul, her brother, to the hospital unresponsive this morning. So please remember them. That's, she's, she's been through enough. Yep. Deuteronomy chapter number 31. We're going to be talking about this directive. And uh, to be quite honest with you, most people don't really probably think the way uh, about this that, that the Bible puts it. But a directive simply is an instruction issued by someone that's in authority. And this is what we're going to read about today. As I read this and we talk about it, there is an instruction that's given by Moses. And remember, guys, the Bible is given by inspiration. So it really is a directive from God. Now, I want you to know what's taking place before I read this, give you a little background, just so you know. The children of Israel had been wandering in the desert for 40 years. And now it was time to go into the promised land. Moses had messed up. And we'll look at that in just a little bit. But Moses had messed up. And God said, no, Moses, you don't get to go into my promised land. Aren't you glad that we have a greater than a promised land on this earth? And to be honest with you, Moses had a greater than a promised land on this earth as well. All of us who are saved, we have a, a promise of the future. And the future that we have is a new heaven, a new earth, new Jerusalem, and we're all going to be together in that place. What a wonderful thing. And so the children of Israel had been wandering for 40 years. It was time for a change. Uh, and Joshua now is going to be the leader. And God is going to raise up Joshua to be that leader. And so the directive is given to Moses to speak to the people. And to speak to Joshua himself and let him know this is what God said. Now, folks, God doesn't speak to us the way he did then. But God still speaks, doesn't he? <clears throat> he speaks through his word. It's that still small voice. If you're saved, you have the Holy Spirit of God on the inside. That's God. And you are sealed with the Holy Spirit of God. And the Holy Spirit will lead you and direct you and guide you. And so we do hear from God. All his sheep hear his voice. Am I right or wrong? Amen. And so we just know when we're hearing from the Lord, it is louder than an audible voice, isn't it? Yeah. Much stronger. So this is the beginning of change for the children of Israel. Under the leadership of Joshua, they will go into their promised land. They had wandered for 40 years and now it was time to go. It was time to get the job done. Now, if we don't get anything else out of this directive today, remember, we've been given a directive in the New Testament, and that's to go, to go. Right now, all over this world, there are men and women and boys and girls who are dying and going to hell. The latest statistic that I, I got the other day, I, I do all that Barna stuff. They send me that stuff. I fill it out and send it back. And so I get these statistics. I get these emails from them all the time. Parents that have children at the age 13 and under, the staggering statistic, and I, I knew I should have wrote it down, <laughs> it's either 2 or 4%, either way it's super low, have a biblical worldview. We're ta not talking about the lost world, people. We're talking about the church world. 2% is what it was. Yeah, 2%. That means that parents in churches in America who have children age 13 and younger, only 2% have a biblical worldview. What is that biblical worldview? What is a biblical worldview? That Jesus is the only way to heaven. Amen. That the Bible is the inerrant, infallible word of God. Amen. That there is no hope of heaven outside of salvation through Christ. A, a biblical worldview means that we are now new creatures in Christ. And that we now want to live a holy life, a separated life, unto God. That's a biblical worldview. And less than 2%. Folks, that's sad. And not only is that sad, that's something you better wake up. And you better understand, our world has dramatically changed over the last 10 years. And in the last 10 years, we have seen a lot of things that have turned the church world upside down. It's not time for us to sit on the premises. It's time for us to stand on the promises. It's not time for us to, to just rest. 
Rest will come eternally. It's time for us to get busy. I mean, get busy. It doesn't take much to stick tracks in the beer cases at Walmart. So when you buy your beer at Walmart and it has a Chandler Heights Baptist track in it, I probably put it there. You bunch of heathens, right? That's right. But God gives the directive now through Moses that we're about to read. And I want you to remember this. God always gives the victory through his power. God is going to lead the children of Israel across into their promised land. And once again, the waters are going to be parted. And they go across and they get to the other side and they then have a battle on their hands. Just because you go and you're being obedient to God's directive to go in this world does not mean there will not be a battle on your hands. But God has already promised us the victory. We are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Let's read this today and then we will get right back to it. Verse number one, down through verse number eight, Deuteronomy 31. And Moses went and spake these words unto all Israel. So it's for everybody. And he said unto them, I am 120 years old this day. And y'all thought you was old. I can no more go out and come in. Also the Lord hath said unto me, Thou shalt not go over this Jordan. And the Lord thy God, He will go over before thee. You ought to underline that in your Bible. And He will destroy these nations from before thee. And thou shalt possess them. And Joshua, He shall go before thee as the Lord hath said. And the Lord shall do unto them as He did to Sion and to Og, kings of the Amorites and unto the land of them whom he de- destroyed. And the Lord shall give them up before your face, that ye may do unto them accordingly, uh, under according to all the commandments which I have commanded you. Be strong and of good courage. Fear not, nor be afraid of them. You ought to underline that one in your Bible too. For the Lord thy God, he it is that doth go with thee, He will not fail thee nor forsake thee. And Moses called unto Joshua and said unto him in the sight of all Israel, Be strong and of a good courage. Moses is now just conveying the directive that God gave to him for Joshua to Joshua. He says, Be strong and of a good courage, for thou must go with this people into the land which the Lord hath sworn unto their fathers to give them, and thou shalt cause them to inherit it. And the Lord, he it is that doth go before thee. He will be with thee. He will not fail thee, neither forsake thee. Fear not, neither be dismayed. Notice that is twice. Don't be afraid. Don't fear what you're going to face. Just keep going. God has already gone on before you. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for this day. Thank you, Lord, for your blessings. Thank you, Lord, for the scripture. I pray, Father, you would take this message now, Lord, and break it down as you see fit and and just feed your people, Lord. Encourage them, edify them, build them up. And I pray, Lord, if there's one soul that doesn't know Christ as Savior, that today might be that day where they understand the death and the burial and the resurrection of Christ sufficient enough for salvation. Lord, we're going to thank you and praise you for what you're going to do. But most of all, we thank you for salvation given to sinners like us, so unworthy. And now, Lord, we ask you that you'd help us to learn today. Help us to grow today. Help us to be ready to go out into the world as we leave here today. Changed in some way. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. This is what you're going to learn today. This is what you're going to cover. So if you don't learn this, it's your own fault, okay? Because... Okay, because I'm telling you what you're going to learn today. All right. I'm putting it out there at the beginning so that you already get it. And, you know, first of all, all God will go before you. God already has gone before you. Y'all realize that tomorrow God's already there, right? God is already in the tomorrow. He's eternal. He knows the end from the beginning. He goes before you. Be strong and of a good courage. That's what you want to learn today. Be strong and of a good courage. Folks, the battle's already ours. We're already seated in heavenly places. I know you know that. You hear it all the time, don't you? I think sometimes we hear it so much we forget it. But to be honest, the battle is already won. We need to be strong and of a good courage. God will not, not fail thee nor forsake thee. Our God doesn't leave us, folks. 
And our God is go the one who gives us the power and the strength. And it is God then that gives the victory. So if you don't learn this today, you probably weren't paying attention. You were on your phone sleeping something. But God's going to go before us. Be strong and of a good courage. God will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. God gives the victory. The directive we find is found in verse number three. And this is it. The Lord thy God, he will go over before thee. He will destroy the nations from before thee. Thou shalt possess them. And Joshua, he shall go before thee as the Lord hath said. God said it. And when God says it, that settles it, doesn't it? Doesn't matter. How many of y'all have seen a bumper sticker? God said it. I believe it. That settles it. It don't matter whether you believe it or not. God said it. That settles it. And this matter is already settled. Now, you and I sitting here in 2023, looking back in hindsight, we know what happened. If you've read the Bible, you know what happened. You know that the victory was given. You also know the people messed up, ended up in captivity, ended up dispersed and all of that stuff. But when they're getting ready to go into this promised land for 40 years, they had wandered in the desert for 40 years. Their shoes did not wear out. They had 40 year old shoes and 40 year old clothes and it never wore out. Might have stunk a little bit, but it never wore out. God fed them manna. They got fed up with that. God fed them quail. They got fed up with that. Nothing God did was good enough until an entire generation died out. There was another generation that was born in the wilderness, except for two, Joshua and Caleb. And so that next generation was born in captivity, or excuse me, in the wandering. And they were raised up in the wandering and they wanted their promised land and they were ready to go. I wish today we'd understand that we have been wandering for a lot of years. And I wish we'd understand that we have been uh, talking about God's business, but not doing God's business. God has promised us great victories, but we're, we're not willing to find the victory because when you find the victory, there's a fight before you get to a victory. And we don't want the fight anymore, do we? We don't, we don't want to get... We don't want to get cursed at. We don't want to get spit on. We don't want to get doors shut in our face. We don't want to get mocked and made fun of. We don't want to get challenged by what we believe. We're scared to death to knock on a door of a lost sinner because they might ask a Bible question that we can't answer. And we don't want to look foolish. Therefore, we allow them to just die and go to hell and we don't really care. Am I right? Come on. If I wasn't right, we'd have a lot of new believers in our church all the time. So let's just get real today, shall we? This ain't, this ain't a slam you message. This is a build you up message. This is an edifying one. This is an encouraging one. So just go ahead and get rid of the guilt right now. We all fail God, do we not? Yes, yes indeed we do. We all fail. So let's just understand that we fail. Now, I don't want to fail God anymore. I'm ready to sharpen my sword. I'm ready to put the armor on. I'm ready to get back out there into that fight. I'm ready to tell the world about Jesus. I, I, I may not be able to knock on every door, but I can get on Facebook and anybody that can see it can see it and hear it. I want to tell the world about Jesus. I want to tell the world where salvation can be found only in the name of Jesus. I have a biblical worldview and I've got to get that message out, especially with the statistics of less than 2% that, uh, of people who have children under the age of 13 have that biblical worldview, which means the church is almost gone. We're building more buildings, we're building more churches, we're building more ministries, but there's no meat and substance to it. And so we've got to get back into that fight. Is everybody with me this morning? So let's look at this. So the directive, first of all, setting the stage, Moses' time was done. He's 120 years old. He's weak, physically close to death. He says he can't get, go out and come in anymore, which means he's pretty much bedfast, okay? And then it says that God was not allowing Moses to go. Here's why. In Numbers chapter number 20 and verse number 8, this is why Moses, we think that God doesn't worry about the little things. Well, folks, sometimes one little thing can affect you the rest of your life. 
and it certainly did Moses. God said to Moses, Take the rod, gather thou the assembly, you and Aaron and your brother, and uh, speak unto the rock. Speak, speak unto the rock. He had already hit it once, and it had split from the top to the bottom. And if you want to know what that rock looks like, you can find it on the interwebs, and it's a picture of it. It's a great big old rock. looks almost heart-shaped, split right down the middle, and where the water had run out, and a stream had flowed from that rock. Pretty amazing. The second time, see, the rock was already broken. That rock is a representation of our rock, Jesus Christ. He was broken for us one time. We do not break Jesus again. We speak to Him. We ask Him. We talk to Him. And He gives us water, does He not? He gives us sustenance. Notice this. God said, speak to the rock before their eyes, before the children of Israel. Teach them the spiritual lesson. And it shall give forth his water, and thou shalt bring forth to them water out of the rock, so thou shalt give the congregation and their beasts to drink. But if you know the Bible, you know he didn't do it, did he? So he goes up to the rock and he gathered all the children of Israel around. Moses was ticked off at this time. He was angry. He was agitated. The people weren't doing what he thought they ought to do, weren't listening to him, weren't following him. And he acted out. He lashed out. How many of y'all have ever done that and just messed everything up? Well, I can guarantee you, you've never done that and messed up as bad as Moses did. Because it kept Moses from inheriting the promised land. Not the eternal promised land, but that temporary promised land. Moses lifted up his hand with his rod and he smote the rock twice. He didn't just hit it once. He hit it two times. If I hit it once the first time and water came out, I'll hit it twice this time and more water will come out. It doesn't work that way. And folks, when you get saved, you only get saved one time. You get the abundance of Christ one time in your life for salvation. Amen. Is everybody with me? You don't have to put Jesus back up on the cross anymore. He already was on the cross. He already died for our sins. He already went to the grave and he rose again the third day. I'm not mighty enough and you're not mighty enough and all the world put together is not mighty enough to crucify Jesus Christ again. Notice this. So the water came out abundantly. God still gave them water. Even though Moses was disobedient, the people still had a need. I want you to realize this. This is the beginning of the end of Moses. Now he's going to wander in the wilderness and he's going to die in the wilderness because he didn't do what God said. Listen to me very carefully. In our generation today, we're not interested in what God has to say much anymore. We're only interested in what feels good. We're interested in the outcome, not the process. Do you realize the process is just as important as the outcome? Doing it the right way is just as important as what results you get in the end. I've heard it said by people, well, we do church a different way. What do you mean you do it a different way? There's only one way. That's the Bible way. Amen. Preaching, praying, singing, magnifying Jesus, telling people about the gospel. Amen. What other way is there? Unless you bring the world in. When you bring the world in, then you're results oriented because... You want to see results rather than see the glory of God. Am I right? Yeah. And so notice this. The Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron. Two witnesses here now. And this is what God said. Because you believed me not. Not because you hit the thing twice. That was the action of not believing me. The action of us not believing is that we're not concerned about all of these children dying and going to hell. The result of us not believing is that we're not willing to speak unto the rock to lead us. Dear Lord Jesus, lead us. Guide us to a, a lost and dying sinner. Dear God, please give me the strength to open my mouth and speak forth that, that word, that water which you have already placed in me. Remember what Jesus told the woman at the well, you drink of the water that I have, you'll never thirst again. You and I who have drank from that water, that well of salvation, we no longer thirst for eternity, uh, sal eternal salvation. We have it, Amen. right? We don't need to thirst after trying to get right with God. We are right with God because of what Jesus did. Because you believed me not to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel to do it my way. In order to sanctify, set God apart from all the other little G-gods, just speak to the rock. 
You see, they saw the power the first time. When Moses hit the rock and that rock split and the water came out, no doubt there were people there that said, look at the great power of Moses. But when he came to it the second time, God said, just speak to the rock so that the people will see that I did this. And they will sanctify me. They'll set me apart from all the other gods. Just speak to the rock and watch the water come out and God gets the glory. Instead, Moses whacks that rock twice with a stick. Because you believe me not. To sanctify me in the eyes of the, the children of Israel. I wonder what we're doing. I wonder what we're doing that keeps us from showing the glory of God to the next generation. I wonder, I wonder how we're treating the rock. I wonder how we're abusing the rock and not showing the glory of our rock, the Lord Jesus Christ, to the next generation. I wonder... Because look what it says. Because you believe me not to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore ye shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given thee. They're going to die in the wilderness. You aren't coming in and they're not coming in. Do you realize what this cost them? This cost them, instead of being in houses, in their towns, with crops growing, this caused them to give birth to little babies out in a dry and a desolate land. This caused them to wander around and walk in circles and even in their sickness and in their infirmities. And when they got down physically, there was no bed for them to lay in. There was no home for them to lay in. There was no plot of land for their family burial ground. They just buried them wherever they died. There's a lot more to this than what we think about as modern day Christians. That meant there was no there was no next generation to take the lead, no, no next one to take over the family business, no next one to take over the family farm, no next one to, to build on to daddy's house. There was no next generation to do. Little did they know God was giving the next generation that he was going to raise up to be godly, mighty warriors. Imagine what they heard from their parents as they wandered in the desert. Well, I don't know why God did this to us. I don't know why God didn't allow us to go back into Egypt. Remember, that's the first thing they wanted to do, wasn't it? Go back into Egypt. Go back to the world. Why didn't God allow us to just go back to the world? Remember when we were in Egypt, we had food aplenty. We had clothes aplenty when, when we were in Egypt. And those children heard that. I wonder how many of us in our generation today... Our children sit and when they hear us talking, they hear us talking about how we used to sin and how we used to do this and how we used to do that and how, how many fights we were in, how much we drank and how much. Instead of listening to stories of how God delivered us from our wickedness, how God delivered us from our sinfulness, how God delivered us from our bondage. Our next generation needs to hear how God delivered us. Amen. They don't need to hear how good it was when you were in Egypt because, folks, it wasn't that good. That's why you had to be saved, and that's why you cried out to God to have mercy on you because you were in the bondage of Egypt, and it was miserable. Amen. The devil has a way of deceiving you, doesn't he? The devil has a way of mocking that and masking that. So Moses' time was done. Joshua had proven himself for 40 years. Flip back a few pages, number 13. I want to show you this. If you don't, have, don't want to flip back, if you can't find it, I can read it to you. It's not a big, big bunch of scripture. But I want you to read this. Verse number one through three or hear this. Numbers chapter 13, and the Lord spake to Moses. Moses was now still vibrant in his ministry here. Send thou men that they may search the land of Canaan, which I give unto the children of Israel. God said, go search the land, which I give. It's already done, isn't it? Did y'all hear that? The battle was the Lord's. The battle was already done. God said, just go look at it. I want you to send out the spies to look at what I'm about to give you. 
You see, when we go out and we do things for God, when we go out and we work for the Lord, we're supposed to go out and see the things God's going to bless us with. Instead of going out there with fear and intimidation and intrepidation, we need to go out there with a might of God, the power of God, the joy of God, knowing we already have the victory of God. He said, which I give unto the children of Israel of every tribe, their fathers shall you send a man, every one a ruler among them. Moses, by the commandment of the Lord, sent them from the wilderness of Paran. All those men were heads of the children of Israel. Now, I know you know about Caleb and O'Shea or Joshua. We don't hear any more about Shuma. We don't hear any more about Palti or, or Gaddy or Amiel or any of them others. We don't hear their name. Why? Because they're a bunch of sniveling cowards. Do you realize, dear brothers and sisters, that our name should be known? Maybe not our personal name, maybe not our first name, but that we are believers in the Lord Jesus. They were first called Christians at Antioch because they were like Jesus, because they behaved like him and talked like him and worshiped like him, loved like him, served like him and even died like him. They were first called Christians at Antioch. You know, we like to call ourselves Christians, but to be honest with you, it's probably better if that lost world says, that's what a Christian is. Amen. Who is he? He's a Christian. Who is she? She must be a Christian because she's living in the victory of Christ. Come on, y'all. Y'all with me this morning? I told you this isn't a harsh message. This is really an edifying one. Just wait. And then you drop down in 13, look at verse 26. They went and came to Moses and Aaron and all the congregation of the children of Israel unto the wilderness of Paran to Kadesh and brought back word unto them and unto all the congregation. And they showed them the fruit of the land. Remember, they had a cluster of grapes. Two men had to carry it. Man, that's some grapes, people. <laughs> It's a land that floweth with milk and honey in verse 27. Nevertheless, verse 28, nevertheless, that ought to be the motto. There ought to be more nevertheless Baptist churches than anything else. I, I see church signs all over. Victory Baptist. Right? There's more Victory Baptists in America than any other name. Did you know that? Guess what? Most of them ought to take victory off and put nevertheless. Nevertheless, Baptist, we would have victory, but you could make it but Baptist. There's a lot of them too, right? Nevertheless, the people be strong that dwell in the land. Nevertheless, we can't go into our community and win the victory because look at all these people. They're strong. They are living in walled cities. They got the walls up. They got the defenses up. They don't want to hear the gospel anymore. Let me tell you something. Nobody wants to hear that they're going to die and go to hell and they deserve it. But when they receive it and God saves them, they'll thank you for it. And very great. Moreover, we saw the children of Anak. They're giants in the land. Look at verse 30. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses. And this is what Caleb said. Let us go up at once. You remember when Caleb comes into the promised land? He's in his 80s. And God had promised him the mountain land. Mountains. In his 80s. Caleb said, give me the mountain. Give me that mountain. I'll take it. If nobody follows me, you put a sword in my hand and watch what God does with this old man. Because the victory is already the Lord's. It was already promised and he believed it. Do you believe it or have you died? Do you believe it or have you quit? Have you laid your sword down? Have you looked at all the obstacles? Listen, 2% that I told you a while ago, that is a huge obstacle. But guess what's on the other side of that obstacle? A whole lot of families that don't know Jesus. A whole lot of people that will suffer in a lake of fire for an eternity. Have we forgotten their outcome? Have we forgotten their eternity? I think quite possibly we have. You drop on down a little bit. Chapter 14, verse number 4. They said one to another, let us make a captain. Let us return to Egypt. 
Do you want to know why most of the churches in America today, and I say this with sadness in my heart, but I got facts. Most of the churches in America are no longer wholly called out assemblies of God. They have gone back to Egypt. They want the sounds of Egypt. They want the sights of Egypt. They want the smells of Egypt. They want the filling of their belly of Egypt. We're supposed to be different. So they got together and they got all these 10 spies that said, no way, there's too many obstacles, no way. But look what happened. And they said, let us make a captain, let us return unto Egypt. We're done with Moses. We don't want God's man anymore. If God's people who are actually saved would just go to a church where there's a man that's called by God to preach the word, we'd have a different country. We got a lot of mama called, daddy called, self called, church called, deacon called, and not God called. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before the assembly of the congregation and the children of Israel, which is the proper position when you need help from God on your face. And Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, which were of them that searched the land, rent their clothes. And they spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to search it is exceedingly good land. If the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it us a land which floweth with milk and honey. Only rebel not ye against the Lord. What'd they do? Rebelled against the Lord. This is all background. Hang tight. The message is going to go real fast. I want you to see this setting of the stage. Now I want you to learn God will go before you. Look at the verse number three of our text. The Bible says, the Lord thy God, he will go before thee. Amen. Notice verse number eight. It is uh, he it is that doth go before thee. It is the Lord that goes before thee. He will defeat the enemy. Satan has already destroyed people. He is a defeated foe. As we get to the last of the last days, he knows his time is short. And he is throwing everything he can, not at the lost world, but at the church. If he can get the church to want to go back to Egypt, then all victory is his. And he's winning a large percentage of the hearts and minds of what used to be God's people. Am I right or wrong? Y'all with me, right? Listen, there are churches. I got a thing in the mail one day, uh, a little postcard, and it was about men's ministry. And it says, we're teaching a men's ministry. It was a local church, and I'm not going to mention the name of it because one, I forget the whole name of the church. I don't want to mention the wrong name of the church. And number two, their name don't need to be mentioned. But I got this card in the mail. We're having... Suds in scripture. All churches invited to bring their men to teach them how to have suds in scripture. That ain't a bubble bath. They're going to get together at one of the breweries, drink some craft beer and read the Bible together. The devil has won. The devil has won. That glass of beer ain't going to send you to hell. Come on. If you're saved, you're saved. But it sure does speak volumes of your testimony in public. Amen. Does it not? Yes. It certainly does. And folks, we need to understand we're supposed to be holy, called out, separated, different. No wonder, no wonder parents, young people who have children under the age of 13, only 2% have a biblical worldview when we're promoting that as holy. Grow up in an alcoholic's home one time where you hear your daddy screaming and cussing at your mom in the middle of the night. Watch him curse you and cuss you, kick you over a chair a couple times. Tell me, oh, it's no big deal to alcohol. Sit with your daddy in the median strip on the interstate because he's passed out drunk, waiting on time to go by, having to pee and scared to get out of the truck because he'd forget you were there and wake up and drive off. You want to tell me how alcohol is a good thing? You have been deceived. Suds in scripture, my hind leg. Notice this. 
the Lord shall give them up. Verse 5, look at this. Y'all still with me, right? The Lord shall give them up before your face. It's already promised. Do you realize you need to stop worrying about what the lost people are going to say to you and what question they might ask you? They don't know nothing about Jesus. And there are some that know a lot about the Bible, but they don't know the right. And if you want to get into an argument with the fool, knock yourself out. I will not cast my pearls before a pig like that. If they want to argue the Bible, I simply say, I'll talk to you when you're reasonable. Come, let us reason together, says the, the Lord. When you want to reason together, we'll reason. But I don't debate and I don't argue. I proclaim. End of story. Enjoy hell. I'm gone. <laughs> when are we going to stop cowering in fear? The battle is the Lord's and he shall give them up. Everybody's still with me. Israel shall possess the land. It's already promised. Joshua shall lead them. New leadership. You know what I think, folks? I think, I honestly think that many times, and we're in the same situation. Many times you get a pastor who's been at a church so long, people no longer hear. It's, well, that's just Pastor Paul. And sometimes you need another voice. Sometimes we as a church need to shift. Come on, y'all. We need to hear other voices. That's why it's important to have revivals. That's why it's important to have in missionaries. You need to hear that other people believe like we do. We're not the only ones. Amen. But sometimes we get to the place. Think about this. For 40 years, they wandered in the desert and Moses himself was defeated. He knew he couldn't go into the promised land. He knew God wasn't going to let that generation go into the promised land. Come on. You think that defeatism didn't rub off? It certainly does. God raised up Joshua out of them. He's one of them. Raised him up. Gave him a boldness. And for 40 years, that man has shown himself faithful, has he not? He said, be strong and of a good courage. Here's part number two, really. First of all, God goes before you. God will go with you outside that door. He'll go with you into this lost and dying world. He will give you the strength to live a holy and a just life. He will give you the strength not to allow the devil to defeat you. It is God that is mighty in you. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. And you personally need to see that so that you can be strong and of a good courage. It's not you. You will fail. God never fails and he never forsakes. Be strong. No need to fear man. You know this. The Bible says greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Matthew 10 says this. Fear not them which kill the body, but rather fear who? The Lord, right? We know this. We've seen this scripture time and time again. God will not. He will not. He will not fail you and neither will he forsake you. It's such an important point in the Old Testament. It is repeated for us in the New Testament. Let your conversation, your manner of lifestyle, remember the suds and scriptures thing? I wish it was the only one of them cards I got. But I got another one from another church who went to suds and scriptures who thought it was such a wonderful idea that they had Brew and Bible. Pastor Paul, we have a new and exciting ministry for your men. Come and have a brew with us as we discuss the topics of the Bible. Brew and Bible, men's ministry. Come on. Come on. It's crazy, is it not? Am I the only one? Let your conversation, your manner of lifestyle be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. What do we have, y'all? 
We have Jesus. We have eternal life. We have everlasting life, never ending, never dying life. We are possessors of the Holy Spirit of God. We are possessed by the Holy Spirit of God. And we have a promise. We're looking for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior. He said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. No matter how hard it gets on this world, no matter how hard it gets in your family, no matter how hard it gets at your workplace, and no matter how hard it might get sometimes at church, God said He will never leave you and He will never forsake you. People, oh yes, they will. God never. Is everybody following me? Now I want you to see this if you don't get this any place else. If you never hear it at another message, if you never read it in the Bible again, he says, he will never leave thee nor forsake thee so that we may boldly say something. We may boldly proclaim to one another as well as to that lost world. We may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, my paraclete called alongside. It's in relation to the Holy Spirit of God. He is my helper. I will not fear. I will not. God will not what? God will not leave you. God will not forsake you. What won't God do? Leave you and forsake you. What do you got to determine to do? I will not fear. What man shall do unto me. Here is where the rubber meets the road for the modern church. I will not fear. How many of y'all have a fear of speaking in public? To be honest. Listen, I've stood in front of thousands of people and sang you can't roller skate in a buffalo herd. Doesn't bother me a bit. You can put me in front of thousands of people, I am at my calmest and at my most natural. But if you and I sit down to have a conversation, I am quite possibly the most backward. I am the dumbest white man that God ever put on planet Earth. I have, thank you, Denny. I have no confidence. Listen, I have no confidence. I, I like that. It's just backwards of most people. Put me in a party, I don't talk. I will find the closest corner, put my back in it so I can keep my eye on you. I will know where every window and every door is. And I will know where everything is I can use to beat my way out of there if I have to. I am socially awkward. But you put me in front of a crowd, I am at my, that's my place. Now, why'd you say all that? Because when I knock on a door, that's where I am the most fearful. When I give a track to someone, I am at my most fearful. We went on a ride up to Gettysburg this weekend with Glory Bound. Yesterday, the lady at the cash register asked me if I'm a pastor. And I'm like, yeah, and walked away because I, I didn't want to have a conversation. Most people, that's not normal. You knew I was weird, right? But listen to me. I can do this, which most people can't. But you can do that, which I struggle with. It's us working together is what it's supposed to take. Now, you can have somebody bigger than AJ threaten to beat me up. I am not afraid. I have no, I'm stupid that way. But if they want to talk about Jesus, I don't want to say the wrong thing. And God help them if they want to talk about something I don't know anything about. Come on. That's just the way it is. We need to learn that we can say this even when we're in the uncomfortable position. In the uncomfortable position, when I have to talk to that person one-on-one, -on -one, I have to have that conversation. I got to figure out how to break the ice. If I've ever visited you in the hospital or at your home, you know what I do. Hey, how you doing? Anything you need? 
All right, I'll pray for you. I'll see you later. That's it. I don't know what else to say. Come on. I struggle with it. Is that all right? Yeah, it's all right. Because I can't change that. But what if I kept that from me going, hey, you doing okay? All right. If you need anything, let me know. I'm out of here. We have to overcome the uncomfortable sometime. And when we overcome the uncomfortable, the only way we can do it is realize we don't need to fear. Because the uncomfortable really is what man shall do to us. When you're scared to stand up here in front of the church and sing a song, or you're scared to stand up here and preach or teach, it's because you're afraid of what they're going to say, what they're going to think, and their response. I could care less. When you talk to somebody one-on-one -on -one and you could care less what they think, you just got to say what you got to say. I'm the opposite way. Remember that. But God does not give you that spirit of fear. But power and love and a sound mind. Power to overcome the fear. Love for a sinner that needs saving. And a sound mind that says, I do not need to fear what man can do to me. God will never leave me nor forsake me. Y'all get that? So stand strong. God will go before you. Be strong and of good courage. God will not fail you. And God gives you the victory. If you go back and you read Joshua chapter 4, just over a few pages, Joshua chapter 4. There's a few things, and from verse 5 to 24, Joshua said unto them, Pass over before the ark of the Lord your God in the midst of Jordan. Take you up, every man of you, a stone upon his shoulder, a big stone, according unto the number of the tribes of the children of Israel. Twelve of them, great big stones. And as they walked across on dry land into the promised land, they stacked those twelve stones up, and the Bible goes on to say so that that next generation, when they see those 12 stones stacked beside that river, they'll say, what meaneth these stones? And so then the, the nation of Israel, the fathers and the grandfathers can say, this is where God gave us the victory. God led us into the promised land. This is where God finally showed Joshua what to do. And Joshua showed the people they did not need to be afraid of the children of Anak. They did not need to be afraid of the walled cities. Remember Jericho? They walked around Jericho and on the last time when God said walk around it, when you get done walking around it, I want you to shout and blow the trumpet and watch the walls fall down. And the walls fell down in Jericho. That really happened. And might I remind you there was a woman who was stained with sin. Rahab was her name. She was a harlot, a prostitute. She heard about the children of Israel and she heard about the God of the children of Israel. And when these spies came in, they said, let the scarlet thread, the scarlet rope outside of your window and you'll be spared. It's a picture of the blood of Jesus. And folks, I want you to understand this. Please hear me and hear me well. We are living in Jericho. The walls are about to come down. Hang that thread. Hang that scarlet thread out the window. Hang it out. Let the world know that the blood of Jesus has been applied to you. There is protection in the Lord. There is deliverance in the Lord. No matter what you were, we now are something different when we put our trust and our faith in Jesus. Remember the victory is yours. And all these things were more than conquerors through Him who loved us. Look what it says. And we're closing in just a moment. Who? Not what, but who? Who do we fear? Men, don't we? We fear what men say. We fear what men do. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Tribulation, it can come your way. That doesn't mean God doesn't love you. He promised to never leave you nor forsake you in the midst of it. Distress, 
That doesn't mean God doesn't love you. It rains on the just and the unjust, but God's never going to leave you in the midst of it. That doesn't mean you're not going to suffer the loss of it and the pain of it and the consequence of it. God is still good whether you got two broken legs or not. God's still good whether you got a, a plate full of ham and biscuits or whether you ain't got nothing. God's still good. God's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. It is us that goes through tribulation. It's us that goes through distress. It is us that goes through persecution. It's us that goes through famine. It's us that goes through nakedness and peril and sword. As it's written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. Guess what? Sometimes it's God's will for you to just suffer and die. And in the midst of it, God is good. Come on. In America, what have we done? We've gone back to Egypt. Well, if you're saved and you love God and God loves you, you're going to have a, a brand new car and you're going to have a nice house and you're going to have lots of food to eat. You're going to have a big bank account. If God loves you, you're going to be healthy. You're going to have good kids. They're going to grow up and love Jesus and be in church. Guess what? That's not what the Bible says. It just might be that God raised you up so that you can suffer and lay in a bed of affliction and suffer with cancer and suffer with some sort of disease and you got sore, sore boils from the top of your head to the bottom of your feet and the dog's got to come and lick the sores. Remember Job? Hey devil, did you consider my servant Job? You can touch him, you just can't kill him. Come on. In all of it, through all of it, in spite of all of it, we're more than conquerors through Christ Jesus, Amen. our Lord. The little saint of God who's been laying in a hospital bed for 40 years with bed sores, can't hardly feed themselves, can't clothe themselves or change themselves. They're just as much a conqueror as you and I today. They have already overcome this world. And in many cases, they are greater conquerors and greater overcomers than we are. And we get one little thing wrong with us. I want to go back to Egypt. Am I right or wrong? We're more than conquerors. I am persuaded. Let me ask you as we close today. Are you persuaded of that? Are we still fussing because we got jobs we don't like? What a first world problem that is. We still complaining because we don't have the insurance we want? What a first world problem that is. We still complaining because we, we don't have the money to, to pay for stuff we want? Come on. Come on. Read the Bible and find out the sufferings of the real, the real sufferings of the children of God. Mm. I'm persuaded neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We're in the midst of a great falling away, church. Great falling away. Our brothers and sisters are fleeing back to Egypt. Their children are born in Egypt. Their children are born in captivity. Their children are captive to the devil. And hell is their destiny. We need to get a grip. We need to get a grip. Last verse. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. It breaks my heart to see the children of God going back into Egypt because I know where their children are. I know where their grandchildren will be. We think somehow God's going to send some great revival and reform. People aren't wanting re revival. Revival is a cry for holiness and righteousness. We want Egypt. 
we want our brew and Bible, our suds and scriptures. Right? You might as well say, I want my crank in Corinthians. I want my hashish in Hebrews. It's stupid. It's foolishness. But it is a revealing tale of where we are. Church, we don't need that. What we need is to realize what God said. This directive... The battle is the Lord's. He's already won the victory. Be strong and of good courage. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. And there's nothing that can separate us from the love of God. Amen. Let's all stand this morning. As we have this invitation hymn, I invite you to respond. If the Lord laid anything on your heart, this altar's open. It's nobody's business while, while you're here. Maybe you want to pray for others. Maybe you want to pray for your family. Maybe God has placed something heart. You need to adjust yourself. The altar's open. If you come. Number 490. Take my life and let it be. Number 490. <clears throat> Take my life and let it be consecrated Take my feet.